This is the Leopold Museum in Vienna, Austria. The Leopold is perhaps the highlight of the museum's quartier, a cultural center with several museums located inside the former court stables of the Habsburg's Hofburg Palace. I do like the carved horse heads atop the entrances. And actually all the entrances have different murals in them. The Leopold Museum houses one of the best collections of Austrian arts. Collected by Rudolf and Elizabeth Leopold throughout the 20th century, the museum opened here in 2001. This museum especially focuses on the Vienna Secession artists, along with some of the largest collections of works by Egon Schiele and Oskar Kokoschka, so I am rather enthused to explore this collection. They do have a photo automat booth, where visitors can pose with famous Viennese artists. Now there is some rather lewd art on display here. In 2021, some Vienna museums including the Leopold were getting banned on social media sites over showing their explicit artwork. So they banded together to create this webpage on a certain site which I'm apparently not allowed to name, in order to display Vienna's plentiful nude art online for a small subscription fee. The museum goes through the history of Austrian art, starting in the 1870s and 80s. During that time, the young budding artist Gustav Klimt would paint commission portraits like this of middle class clients from photographs. That is a portrait of a Hanja girl done by Klimt while he was still a student at the Vienna School of Decorative Arts. That is an 1896 portrait of a blind man by Klimt. And this is a bronze bust by August Rodin, who stylistically influenced Klimt, and himself exhibited many of his works at the Vienna Secession later on. In this portrait of a blind man by Klimt, he experimented with lighting effects, and he would go on to present this work at the first Secession exhibition in 1898. This case contains a sketch study of Juliet that Klimt did to prepare for his Theater of Shakespeare ceiling painting at the Berg Theater. And there is Klimt's Golden Cross of Merit, which was awarded to him in 1888 by Emperor Franz Josef himself. Gustav Klimt, who was trained in the more classical style popular at that time, opened a workshop to produce murals with his younger brother Ernst Klimt, who would die young, and their friend Max Merch. However, throughout the 1870s, Hans Machart was the king of art in Vienna. He had been invited by the emperor to come to Vienna and dominate the art scene for a while. During the late 19th century, realism became fairly popular in the Vienna art scene. While this movement had its origins in France with Corot and Courbet, by the late 1860s and 70s, art students in Vienna began being exposed to this Proto-Impressionist style. They have tilted several natural scenes throughout the museum by 3 degrees to emphasize the dangers of the world warming by 3 degrees Celsius. Max Lieberman was a German realist artist who had connections to Vienna. This painting was a study he did for his famous Net Menders in 1889. Emil Jakob Schindler painted the scene of a forest lane near Scharfling in 1890. Here is a painting by one of the earliest and most important realists, the French artist Gustave Courbet. And this is Courbet's depiction of the White Cliffs at Dover, painted in 1866, which has also been tilted. Tina Blau Long was an early female artist. She is known for her depictions of the Prater, as it looked in the early 20th century. In 1898, several Viennese artists such as Gustav Klimt, Coleman Moser, and Josef Hoffmann rebelled against the artistic establishment of Vienna by founding the Secession, an organization through which they would create and exhibit modern art in Vienna. In 1899, Josef Maria Olbrich designed an unusual structure taught by a golden cabbage to host the exhibitions of the Secession. The architect Josef Hoffmann designed the cabaret Fluttermouse in Vienna and custom designed just about every aspect of it, intended to be a Gesamtkunstwerk, which is German for a total work of art. With Hoffmann, everything had to fit the aesthetics perfectly. Josef Maria Achenthaler made these Dance of the Elf scenes for the Beethoven music room of a Viennese villa. 
The Secession would often host exhibitions featuring the modern works of leading international artists. There is a bronze sculpture by Edgar Degas of a pregnant woman. There's a view out the window of the Naturhistorisches Museum and the Kunsthistorisches Museum. The Art History Museum for which Klimt was commissioned to paint some historicist scenes in the Grand Stairway. There is a whole big room full of works by Gustav Klimt. Probably the most influential Viennese artist and definitely an unusual individual. Klimt did many landscapes throughout his career, usually on square crop canvases. This is the Orchard from 1898. His orchard in the evening has been tilted by 3 degrees. Gustav Klimt was a leading force behind the Vienna Secession, and even his poster for their first exhibition was scandalous, as he portrayed Theseus' genitalia, which he had to cover up with a tree. This is pretty neat, a replica of Gustav Klimt's studio. He worked in the same studio for nearly two decades until 1911, this one has been reconstructed to its 1911 appearance, with some custom furnishings by Josef Hoffmann. He had his own cabinet of curiosities, and even a human skeleton on display. There is a postcard written by Klimt, and a viewfinder card of his estates. Gustav Klimt was commissioned to create three ceiling murals for the Great Hall of the University of Vienna, which for the most part were critically attacked. Most people claim that they had little to do with their subject matters, philosophy, medicine, and jurisprudence, and also featured a lot of nudity. They would never actually be installed at the university. Klimt eventually resigned from the commission and gave his payment back. Then the Nazis destroyed them in 1945, so these are replications. This is philosophy, the first of the panels, which disturbed a lot of people, as these figures are shown in aimless trance in a void, Sigmund Freud's psychoanalysis was developed at the same time as Klimt's artwork evolved. His works definitely have some connections to Freud, as they often display an unconscious struggle between Eros and Thanatos, the drive for life and the drive for destruction. This is the only landscape that Klimt ever created featuring his hometown of Vienna. It's a 1916 depiction of the park at Schönbrunn Palace. It's also his only landscape with little people in it. This is the Litzelberg Keller. A close-up view of a rural restaurant painted between 1915 and 16. Here's a unique piece called On Lake Outersea, done in 1900. Here is the large Poplar II, or Gathering Storm, another scene painted at his beloved Outersea. The Black Bull is an unusual piece for Klimt's. The city-dwelling artist was actually impressed by these stables at the brewery inn where he stayed near Ottersea, so he painted a bull in there. Emilia Floga, along with her sisters, started a fashion studio in Vienna, where they would often make designs of the Wiener Werkstatt, and she became Klimt's lifelong partner. There are some of Emilia Floga's designer scarves, bag, and mirror, along with a necklace that was designed by Kalman Moser and gifted to Floga by Klimt's, and a Bruccion that was designed by Josef Hoffmann. And this was Emilia Floga's suitcase. This is one of Gustav Klimt's masterpieces. He started studies for this in 1908, and finally completed it in 1915. It is an allegory of the human cycle of life. Death haunts the left side of the canvas in a dark void, while a three-part cycle of life is represented on the right side. There is a mother and child, a pair of lovers, and an elderly woman, so there's a fascinating contrast as death looms over them. This piece received first prize at the International Exhibition of Art in 1911. Also in November of 2022, not too long before my visit, some more on climate protesters threw a black liquid onto it. Luckily the painting itself was undamaged, and it's on display like usual. I wonder if they have done the tilted paintings because of this event. Here is a great example of that golden period secession aesthetic with the golden background design. This is a model of the Santorium at Perkersdorf by Josef Hoffmann, which was especially designed with straight lines and squares in hopes of calming patients. Josef Hoffmann designed this adjustable armchair, 
called the Sitting Machine for the Sanatorium. Hoffman was a big proponent of the Gesamtkunstwerk, which in architecture means that every conceivable aspect about the building contributes to it being a total work of art, such as the Palais Stockle. Here is a great display of products by the Wiener Werkstatt, which was founded by Hoffman and Moser in 1903. Their collective produced a range of both decorative and functional, carefully handcrafted products, furniture, textiles, and even buildings. Josef Hoffman was fixated on squares, especially early in his career, and also usually worked in black and white only. There are many of Hoffman's hand-sketched designs on display. This whole room is dedicated to Coleman Moser, a multi-talented artist who painted this mountain range in 1913. It is more of an abstract composition, but still follows the natural flow of the lines, so you can still make out a mountain range. This is Le Sun, Le Chamasser, another scene he painted of the mountains as simmering. That is a theater cloak designed by Moser, showing how he could work in many different mediums. He also painted this one, Rainy Day, which has been tilted. Moser designed most of these furnishings for Fritz Verndorfer, the initial financier of the Wiener Werkstatt. This is a blueprint designed by Coleman Moser for a stained glass window of the church at Steinhof, a modern church designed by Otto Wagner. Here are more chairs and paintings by Moser. That painting is Venus in the Grotto, which does exhibit some remaining influence from his classical education at the Vienna Academy of Fine Arts. And the hiker on the left was intended as a companion piece to Venus in the Grotto. The next gallery is a face-off between some very different modern architects in Vienna. There are more works of Colin Moser, both examples of his furnishings and his paintings. Many of these come from the apartment Eisler von Terramera, that is an inlaid wardrobe from the apartment. Otto Wagner was a crucial Secession-style urban planner and architect, who in a lot of ways transformed Vienna. He also worked with the younger Moser in his famous Linke Wienzel buildings, including the Mahalika House, where these furnishings are from. Wagner also designed the city railway in many of the present-day U-Bahn stations, along with the railway bridges and viaducts. This is an original example of his trackside railing. Wagner designed the Postal Savings Bank. I didn't have a chance to visit that, but it is an innovative and modern Art Nouveau building composed of reinforced concrete, aluminum, glass, and other new materials. Here is a really unique bedroom designed and decorated by Josef Hoffmann in 1902. Again, in the spirit of the Gesamtkunstwerk, he designed every element of the bedroom, including its interesting color scheme, to create an overall uniform impression. These Secession architects are juxtaposed by the work of Adolf Loos, who developed a different form follow function philosophy of architecture, and became a big critic of the Secession and Art Nouveau. He was very much against ornamentation. His Loos house apartment block in Vienna was not very popular, and these are furnishings he designed for the Café Museum. The next rooms are filled with works by the expressivist Oskar Kokoschka, who was perhaps the most influential of the post-Secession generation of Viennese artists. Kokoschka was also a playwright. He staged a moving picture of the cabaret Fluttermouse, and this is a poster he made for his play, Murderer, Hope of Woman, that was performed at the International Kunstschau in 1909. These are his posters for the 1908 International Kunstschau, which Klimt and Hoffmann had invited him to participate in. He published his early portfolios in the German avant-garde magazine Der Sturm. Here are some Kokoschka portraits done in the 1910s. This is a portrait of Natalie Bacheski from 1907, one of Kokoschka's first commissions. The sitter and her whole family would be killed in the Holocaust. This is a self-portrait of Oskar Kokoschka, Pain between 1918 and 19, he is touching his face here as a response to his shell shock from service in the Great War. And that is a bust of Oskar Kokoschka from the 1960s. This is a self-portrait with etching needle made late in life in 1971. Here is a portrait done in 1933. 
He fled Austria just a year later in 1934. Due to the ever-worsening political situation, he painted this scene in that year, The Two Girls. This is The Lace Maker painted in 1933. Kokoschka fell in love with the composer Gustav Mahler's widow, Alma Mahler. However, in 1912, the year before he sketched this scene of them together, she became pregnant and had said pregnancy terminated. Kokoschka never got over that apparently and would carry around a cloth soaked in the embryo's blood around with him, claiming it was his only child. Oh boy, here on this fine Josef Hoffman design bench is a replica of Oskar Kokoschka's fetish doll. Yep, after they split up, he had this custom designed sex doll made with Alma Mahler's features, and this was the subject of much of his work for several years from 1918 to 1922. Then he staged her murder in effigy by dousing the doll in wine, then beheading her. As mentioned, he fled to Prague, where he painted many landscapes like this view from the Monastery of the Knights of the Cross with a red star. Here is a scene of Amsterdam that he did in 1925. And those are flowers in the window painted in the same year. The Leopold has one of the largest collections of another expressivist artist with a tragic personal life, Richard Gerstel. Throughout his brief career, he developed a unique and radical expressivist style, as exemplified in this semi-nude self-portrait. This is a portrait of Reserve Lieutenant Alois Gerstel, the artist's brother painted in 1906. Gerstel struggled to make friends at the Vienna Academy of Fine Arts, as he rejected the Secession style. However, he did manage to befriend the composer Arnold Schoenberg. Then he actually ended up having an affair with his wife Matilda, who for a brief stint would leave her family to travel with Gerstel a bit. Then she left Gerstel a few months later in 1908. So one night not too long after that in his studio, Gerstel burned a lot of his artwork, along with his papers and letters, then stabbed and hanged himself. He was 25 years old. This is the lakeside road near Munden, painted in 1907. He really was ahead of his time. That scene is called On the Danube Canal. This is a portrait of Matilda Schoenberg in the garden, painted in the year that they would run away together, then he would later commit suicide. This is the couple in the countryside, also painted in 1908, while he was staying with the Schoenberg family that summer. There is a seated woman in a green blouse, also done in 1908. This is the nude self-portrait, which at least back then was still a very unusual subject matter. While he is abstracted beyond recognition, it is believed that this displays his sadness after his rejection from Matilda, and he did commit suicide just a couple weeks after creating this. And this is a portrait of Henrika Kohn, Besides Vienna's Military History Museum, which has a huge portfolio of sketches, the Leopold has the largest collection of works by Egon Schiele. This is Self-Seer II, or Death and Man. Throughout his oeuvre, he explored the motif of the self-portrait as a means of expressing self-crisis and insecurity. In this work, The Lyricist from 1911, he presents himself as a contorted lyricist, and it was executed by rapid brushstrokes. This is a self-portrait with raised bare shoulder, which was painted on wood in 1912. It is particularly expressive due to the restricted nature of that tiny canvas. Here is another great self-portrait with lowered head. Clearly he had a totally unique form of expressivism. This is the seated male nude, a self-portrait made in 1910 by the 20-year-old artist in a pursuit to display his own ego. This piece and most of his body studies are considered as a reflection of what it means to be human, going back to Freud's theory of the struggle between Eros and Thanatos. They compare Sheila's depictions of the body with these bronze sculptures of August Rodin, renowned for his innovative impressions of body movement and expression. He was definitely a big influence on Sheila. That is an earlier depiction of Sheila's uncle and guardian at the piano. By 1907, he hadn't fully developed his style yet. 
This painting, titled Hermits, is somewhat of a mystery. No one knows who these figures are supposed to represent, possibly his father who died when Sheila was young, or even his mentor, Gustav Klimt. They would both end up dying in 1918. This is the autumn tree in stirred air, or the winter tree. Even his landscapes are intense. His small tree in late autumn has been tilted a few degrees more. This is the portrait of Vali, who is Sheila's long-term partner. It belonged to a Jewish art dealer in 1938, so it was looted by the Nazis. In the early 2000s, the Leopold loaned this piece to MoMA, where questions were raised about its provenance, and it got held up in restitution court proceedings in the United States. A settlement was reached, and the Leopold was able to keep the painting. This is Sheila's self-portrait with Chinese lantern plant painted in 1912. He really found a distinctive way to express his personality and body. That is a portrait of Poldy Ludzinski from 1910. Here is the Morning Woman created in 1912. He did not give it that title, though. This is a famous work of Sheila's called The Cardinal and the Nun. Depicting a cardinal and nun getting caught engaging in things they are not supposed to be doing. Here is the landscape with ravens, which he painted after moving to a rural location in Lower Austria in 1911. Sheila wrote that this piece reveals a revelation of the individual. This scene depicts a man's revelation, though it remains unconfirmed what the subject's revelation is. The procession is one of Sheila's most enigmatic works as the figures are interwoven into the landscape. That's pretty interesting. Cavalry is an expressivist scene of a hilltop station of the cross amid some Lower Austria scenery. The Blind Mother is a large painting from 1914 and was displayed by the Munich Secession. The distorted posture of the mother is known to have been directly inspired by Rodin's Crouching Woman. This was a preceding scene Dead Mother 1, another somewhat dark and melancholic scene regarding motherhood. It is displayed next to another mother and child scene, his take on a Madonna and child icon. This landscape, the setting sun, has been tilted by 4 degrees, one degree more than the others we've seen. Sheila also produced many enigmatic cityscapes, including many scenes of the town of Stein on the Danube in the year 1913. He aimed to capture the soul of the things he painted, certainly not how they really looked, so they are usually revealing a sort of melancholy or other feeling that he may have felt when viewing a city or something in nature. The Houses by the Sea, or Row of Houses, was also the subject of a restitution case in 2012. It was part of Jenny Steiner's collection that was confiscated and sold by the Nazis. The Small Town 3 is really a depiction of Chesky Kromlov, which is definitely not a small town, and that was probably Sheila's favorite city. The House Wall on the River is another scene of his mother's birthplace, Chesky Kromlov. Krumau on the Vitava is a prime example of the flat composition that he would often use in these cityscapes, with an extreme aerial view. These are some odd perspectives. Crescent of Houses 2, or Island Town, is one of his most impressive cityscapes of Chesky Kromlov. Here is the house with shingle roof, with exaggerated shingles and pieces of laundry on the old house. That piece is called The Mother with Two Children 2, painted in 1915. That antique Tyrolean folk art toy horse was owned by Egon Schiele, who had his own folk art collection and he featured it in this one-of-a-kind work displayed right next to the horse. The still life with books on the artist's desk from 1916. This is the reclining woman from 1917, a monumental female nude in Sheila's expressive and sensual style. His wife Edith probably posed for this work. This is a bust that Sheila sculpted of himself. This is the Transfiguration, done in 1915 shortly before his entry into military service during the Great War. And these are the Lovers, which was never finished as he passed away in 1918 at the age of 28 in the Spanish flu epidemic. His wife had died three days prior. 
So I really enjoyed the Leopold Museum. It displays a fantastic collection focused on a captivating period of Vienna art history in some well-designed and curated gallery spaces. I ran out of time to see the lower level galleries of the permanent collection, as I wanted time to see the temporary exhibition, the Vert Collection, which features some amazing selections from a private collection of modern and contemporary art by significant artists that is featured in a separate video that is linked in the description. I also have many other videos on Vienna museums and attractions, along with tours of art museums, exhibitions, historic locations, and much more across Europe and the United States. Please like this video, share it, and subscribe to my channel for more. Thanks for watching.